from inception to execution, uh, the territory took three and a half years to make. The crew on the territory varied pretty dramatically during the dry season when fires were burning. Uh, we would have multiple teams filming. And then during the rest of the year, it would be a really small crew of just two or three people. We started on the Sony FS7 and then moved to the FX9 and FX6. And the indigenous community shot on the Sony NX80. Making the territory, we lost two drones and one cinema camera. We covered thousands of kilometers of driving and rivers and boat trips. Just, uh, yeah, uh, put some real miles on those cars. A floresta, os rios, é nossa casa. Onde a gente se mantém. Can you break down the conflict between the settlers and the indigenous tribe living in the Amazon? The territory follows an environmental conflict in Brazil. An indigenous community is defending a massive area of rainforest, so well-defined that you can see it from outer space as this dark green island of old growth forest surrounded on nearly all sides by raised deforested farmland. And under this new government in Brazil, led by Jair Bolsonaro, Farmers uh, feel emboldened to colonize, invade, and steal this indigenous territory. And so the film follows that conflict between a young indigenous leader fighting to defend his home and the leader of an association of farmers that are intent on colonizing a new city deep within their protected territory. <laughs> What drew you to the story? I studied environmental science, climate science, and so I've been thinking about conservation issues a lot. A lot of my work focuses on our relationship with the planet. And when I read about Nadinia, the activist in our film, and her work tirelessly, fearlessly defending the rainforest and indigenous rights under this dark cloud of a looming Bolsonaro administration, I felt like I, I just had to reach out to her and understand more about her life. And so this film really came from a fairly old school email saying, hey, I love what you're doing and I would love to spend a, a couple of weeks with you. The relationship with Nadinia started out really cautiously. I think she, like a lot of people, felt like there had been these white American, you know, outside journalists who were coming in, taking stories from this community and she wasn't seeing much really change for them on the ground. And so one of the things we discussed early on was if we were going to make this story together, she really felt it was important to go and investigate the source of this violence and destruction as she saw it, which were these poor marginalized farmers being pushed into land theft and other types of things by bigger moneyed interests behind them. You know, talking through a lot of that with her, understanding her priorities in, in working on a film together, I think we, we reached an understanding of what this film would, would look and feel like. O sonho brasileiro de quem tá vivendo aqui é ter seu pedacinho de terra para poder trabalhar, né? Tirar ali o seu sustento. Tell me about the first time that you set foot on the protected territory. The first time I arrived at the Uruau territory was during an invasion. You know, I was following Nadinia. She had responded to a phone call about an invasion that was happening on their territory. And so we met in this moment of crisis. Uh, and I was there and I, I filmed and then afterwards stepped back and said, OK, let's let's understand more about this community. Let's understand what their experience of this conflict has been like. And that began a much longer, slower process of working with the community to describe the film that I thought, you know, we were trying to make, the film that they wanted to be made, and also working to explain what filmmaking is, what documentary filmmaking is, and my understanding of it. You know, the elders in this community had never seen a feature film before. So how do you even start a conversation about whether somebody wants to embark on this multi-year project without them having a really strong understanding of what that means, both in the nitty gritty of like, I'm going to be all up in your business eight hours a day. There's not a lot of privacy to, you know, the more abstract, but really very important ideas of, you know, narrative autonomy, that you are handing somebody the reins to your story and potentially millions of people are going to form an opinion about your community based on the way that this group of people who aren't from this same area are choosing to represent you. And so we had a lot of long, slow conversations about that. Ela é para mim no meu ponto de vista o coração, não do Brasil, mas sim do planeta em geral. 
So what did you ultimately have to do then to get their okay, to get their approval and their consent? It involved a lot of conversations about how films are made. So I brought some cameras with me and said, okay, you, you film me, I'll film you. Ask me about my life in New York. Ask me about why I'm making this film. Okay, now that you kind of understand your way around a camera and what it is that I'm, I'm pointing at people, let's talk about how films are edited, that you can take you know, moments from different times of day and combine them to give a new mood. You know, All of that built, I think, a, a common understanding of, of what a film is, what it entails, what it's possible of in its most aspirational senses when it reaches millions of people and, and helps them understand a conflict that isn't their own, but also what it costs and you know, what you're giving up by being part of it. And I think once we had that common understanding, it felt like we could move forwards together. And then obviously when COVID came, we were cut off from working with the Uruwau in person anymore. And at that point they said, Alex, look, you know, we think we've got it from here. We can, we can shoot, manage, produce the final act of this film ourselves. And so we really leave the film in a narrative sense in their hands, moving from sort of a participatory framework when we started into a real co-production. We signed a contract with them and they were involved in some of the business decisions around the film. They were involved in you know, profit sharing when, when we were able to sell the film. It really grew, but it grew pretty organically, I would say, over the course of production. Why was it important to include the POV of the settlers as well? The settlers' ideology is really at the core of this conflict, and it's, you know, a conflict with a different face in some ways, but it's also a really similar conflict to what has happened in settler colonial states around the world. You know, as soon as I met these farmers, I understood really quickly the historical parallels between Brazil nowadays and the United States, you know, only 150 years ago, the idea of manifest destiny, the idea of divine right to the land, the idea that land is somehow empty or, or devoid of life until they as white people arrive. When really we know that's you know completely not true. The standing forest is alive and well and home to many, many indigenous people around the world. They were interested in being part of a project that would listen to them and listen to their, their view of themselves as heroes. I was interested in making a project that did listen to them and, and try to not strictly demonize them or, or turn them into storybook villains, but to try to understand the motivations that they had for engaging in these obviously destructive practices. And I was interested in filming them as much digging holes in the hot sun as I was interested in filming them lighting fire to the rainforest. But the parts of their lives that they saw as you know, good, honest family men were going to be portrayed alongside the parts of their lives that fell outside of the law. Yeah, let's talk about witnessing a crime, an action. It is legal to destroy this territory. There's a particularly harrowing scene where a very, very old tree is sawed down. As a documentarian, like, what are your responsibilities to capture that and to portray it accurately? And also, is there like a moral dilemma that you're dealing with while watching this happen? Yeah, it was a huge internal emotional dilemma through all of this. I mean, you're spending time with people whose views you really personally disagree with. And I would talk to Sergio and, and these other characters as much as I could and try to explain, you know, the ecosystem services that the forest is providing them as farmers. If they want rainfall to continue on, on the continent and they want to be able to harvest these crops, they need that, that forest to remain standing. We would have those conversations, but it was really this very myopic, short-sighted view of just me and mine. Um, you know, and they were quite naive. They, they weren't well-educated about you know, the history of Brazil or the ecological consequences of what they were doing. Of course, that doesn't change the way that I feel watching the rainforest be, be lit on fire or anything like that. But at the same time, when they were there lighting fire to the rainforest, Bolsonaro was in the media that same month saying that it was indigenous people and NGOs lighting fire to the rainforest to undermine Brazil's national sovereignty and drum up support for their nefarious causes. And so getting those images did feel really important to be able to say, no, this is proof. This is happening. This is real. And we need to talk about it. That particular shot with the tree falling, that felt really emotional to me. Like you, the sounds of it in particular, you know, the forest is alive with these calls, mating calls, all types of interactions are happening not necessarily visually, but sonically, you feel how alive this place is and how it's a home to so many things. And 
when a tree like that falls, it goes quiet for just a brief moment right afterwards. Everything's a little spooked. And then it comes back, to, you know, comes back to life. We worked really hard uh, with our sound design team, uh, Peter Albrechtson and Huna Clausen, and then also with our composer, Katya Mikhailova, who traveled with me to Brazil to record the sounds of trees falling, the sounds of Uruwa bows and arrows going off, um, hydrophones in the water, all sorts of sounds, and used those then instrumentally to build the score out of the environment in which the film takes place, rather than trying to impose it on the film externally. And then spent a lot of time as well working between sound design and score to make sure that they worked really fluidly together. I remember Katya put a, a contact microphone on this really beautiful old, I mean, hundred year old tree as it was being cut over by some illegal loggers. And that splintering sound really like hollow, eerie crackling we used several times in the fire scene, trying to really make sure you feel like it's a death when that tree does fall. You have two different opposing opinions and you're spending a lot of time, intimate time with both sides of this debate. Did your subjects ever uh, express frustration that you were spending so much time with the person that they are in direct conflict with? And how did you work that out? We had to be really honest with everybody from the beginning, both for kind of moral, ethical you know, reasons, as well as just straight up security reasons that we were filming with everybody involved in this story. The worst thing for myself and the other people that were filming with the invaders would be for them to feel deceived by us and to think that we were spying on them or that we weren't who we said we were. And so we had to be really upfront that we are filming with multiple sides of this story. You're gonna to get to speak for yourself. You're gonna get your moment to say your piece, but there are gonna be other views presented alongside yours that directly disagree. We didn't say, you know, we're filming with Sergio head of this association and we're filming with Bitete Uruwa because that could have created conflict where there otherwise wasn't one. But it's also important to note that there, there are dozens of these farmers associations all vying for different parts of the land. And so we specifically tried to find access to two sides of the conflict that we hoped wouldn't ever actually come, come into physical uh, conflict with each other because that would have been really really complicated and difficult. Acabar com o povo indígena, acabar com os isolados, a gente não vai permitir que aconteça, não. 